All right. All right, so I just did uh, another presentation uh, this room, but um, for the new people, uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Alex, and uh, we'll be talking about pen testing, uh, MySQL, and Postgres SQL. So again, my name is Alex. I have been working with MySQL for 15 plus years. I uh, joined MySQL AB, the company behind MySQL, in uh, 2006, and uh, it was acquired by Sun Microsystems by Oracle. And uh, about four years ago, I joined AWS as a database engineer working on a relational database as a service, MySQL uh, primarily. And then I switched to security. So my uh, interest in security started with uh, playing capture the flag games and uh, other things and uh, Linux research. And uh, I started a new team at AWS. Uh, we called it RDS Red Team. We're doing pen testing and we also do the security research around uh, open source databases. So let's talk about pen testing, a white hat hacker. So what does a pen tester do, right? So they impersonate a bad guy, a black hat, and try to break things. So it simulates a hacker attack pretty much. This is what we do, uh, and we're trying to find things, find security issues in, in this case, in open source databases. So here's our assignment for the day. We're going to break an open source database. And this will be primarily MySQL, but also Postgres. So our assignment has uh, uh, three steps. Step number zero, we establish a database connection. That's a prerequisite. When we got some level of access inside the database, our next step will be to escalate the privilege inside the database. I'm not talking about uh, OS level yet, right? So we need to get the full privileged user inside the database. And then we will do what is called escape, database escape. You have your SQL protocol user, and then you want to get from that to get to control the OS, to get a shell access. And then finally, we will try to attack a database administrator who connects to the database. This part I already uh, presented, so I'll be not be presenting that again. And this is the whole result of that. In this result, we control everything. We control the database, we control the operating system where the database is running, like Linux, and we even control the workspace, the workstation of the database administrator. So what's our plan? We're here. We need to establish the database connection. What we do? What we do? Basically, there are multiple ways how a bad actor can do that, how we can do that to simulate that. The, usually, the database is behind the firewall. And hopefully, the database, your database server, your MySQL server, is not exposed to the internet. If it's exposed, then an attacker will try to connect to that MySQL and try to brute force the password. Right? So if the database is exposed, then the usual way is to either do a brute force or find a CVE, uh, authentication level CVE, where we can connect to the server. If it's not exposed, then the usual way to go into is through the SQL injection. So let's quickly take a look at this scenario. An SQL injection application server, and then you get into relational database. So this is a quick example. I just want to set up a stage here. Here's the quick example of the MySQL inje SQL injection. So what do we have here? We, this application <coughs> written in Ruby on Rails, 
Or is it Python? It's Python, mm -hmm. actually. <laughs> so, uh, the, this application will allow to pass the input from the user directly into the SQL. What is problematic here is that the string is being created by concatenation. And the string will go directly to uh, MySQL in this case. And this is me looking at this code. Uh, so this is a trivial SQL injection. So you can append a union query to your select statement and then what you can do here is you can actually select from the mysql.user. So mysql has a system table, oh sorry, system database called mysql. And it has a table which is called users, which is an al analog of etc password plus etc shadow. Right? There is a hash of password. But what if we have, we don't have an access to mysql.user table? our access control rights are configured properly. So now we're here. We have successfully established the connection to the database, but probably we have a low privileged user inside the database. So what's our next step? Our next step is to try to establish to find a privilege escalation inside the database. So let's take a look at the fictional scenario. In this fictional scenario, we have a company that stores the healthcare data. And this company has a massive, big, massive MySQL database. And this company also have a WordPress database, which is uh, located on the same instance. In this WordPress database, there's nothing interesting there. And we have found a way to get an access to this WordPress uh, website, a static website, and through that WordPress website, we have found a way to get into the database and get uh, the user. Now, we have a healthcare database, it's isolated. So it's nothing interesting here, but the question is in our our goal is to find a way how we can download the healthcare records. So we have another database called MySQL. And its MySQL database has a system information. You know, and it's protected. So what would you do? We will use, in this case, we will try to use what we call the confused deputy problem for the database. So confused deputy is a situation, it's a computer program, according to Wikipedia, it's actually a computer program that is tricked by another program to execute an action on the behalf. So confused deputy problem, confused deputy program could not distinguish between a valid authorization action and invalid authorization action. So, I'll need to go deeper to explain that, and I will quickly go through the confused deputy problem for Linux. Imagine, and we are stepping out of the database world and get into the Linux thing, right? So, and then we'll go back to the database. So, here's the situation. We have a cron tab, and we have a situation where as a system administrator on Linux, I want to make sure that every file inside of the user directory is owned by its own user. This is how it should be. So if I create a user in the home directory as root, then this, this file will not be accessible. So I need to make sure that everything is clean. So then I created this cron tab. And this cron tab will find all the uh, files under EC2 user home directory and shown it to EC2 user, which is logical. Now, what can go wrong? And to demonstrate what can go wrong, I have recorded this quick demo. So we have two sides here, right? This is my root 
user. And this root user has this cron job to fix the file ownership issues. Let's say that I, as root, created a file in the home directory of EC2 user. Now we have this cron job, which will fix that. And in a minute, the cron job will run and do the churn. So this is right. This is how it is supposed to be. Now what's wrong? Now my EC2 user is actually a hacker. And this user has find a way to confuse that cron job to be able to get a privilege escalation in Linux. How does it do that? It creates a symlink. So it creates a symlink to ETC password. So it creates a symlink inside of its own home directory that will point to ETC password. Now, our <coughs> cron job will run in a minute. And what we will do, it will do, it will actually follow this symlink. So it will do ETC password. It will follow the symlink and do the churn and churn the ETC password to EC2 user. So we'll wait maybe 30 seconds more, and we will see what will happen. Now, ETC password is owned by EC2 user. What it means? Privilege escalation. That means that that user can actually edit ETC password user, no, file, sorry, and then create another root, or change the user ID to root. So this is the demonstration of the confused deputy problem on Linux OS. So let's go back to our database. And the question is, can we use the same approach, the same idea, to get a privilege escalation inside the database? To do that, first of all, we'll need to examine what is there, what's in our database. We do select user from MySQL user, mysql.user. Uh, mysql.user is a table. So we will see the list of users that are on this host. And then we will figure out there is a user that is dedicated for the WordPress website. And there is a user that is dedicated for the healthcare record. So here we have a boundary between those two databases and between those two users. A user that only have an access to the WordPress will not be able to even read uh, the uh, health records, obviously. We also have this, another interesting user, which is called monitor. In MySQL, you can do this command, show grants, and it will tell you what actual grants, what actual privileges does this user have. So we examine that, it's all normal. For Corp Web Press user, we have grant all privileges on this database. And then healthcare has its own uh, user. We also have a monitor user. So what is this monitor user? Let's see. So this monitor user has a global select. And I also have an execute. And it's star dot star, so that means that all and every database. We can only guess what this monitor user is. It's not standard. It's someone installed a monitoring system. And this monitoring system have this user. So let's uh, take a look at what we already obtained. Right? We obtained our WordPress user, which is the limited user, and if we'll try to retrieve the passwords from other users, the hash of passwords, it will fail because the mysql.user uh, table is protected. And now let's say if we have uh, this monitor user, then we can do that. We can retrieve the hashes of passwords for any user. It has a global select. It can also read all and every healthcare database records. 
So <coughs> there is some sort of performance monitoring system installed. MySQL, for MySQL, there are multiple monitoring systems that will allow database administrators to get some insights on the database. There is a Percona monitoring system, there is an enterprise monitor, there are many of them. So, what this monitoring system do? It will connect to our database. It can also run the explain plan. So what does the explain plan do? Explain plan is a way to retrieve the performance information about how the select query, usually select query, performing. So you run explain and then you take your select query and then you get the information is a how many records it will scan and stuff like that. The question is, will it re-execute the queries? It should not. But in reality, in some cases, if you run, if you take your select query and you want to know why this select is slow and you run explain, it will actually re-execute this query again, which is not logical. Right? The whole idea of the explain is to just provide you information. So this has been found originally by Percona, the consulting company. And uh, the, if you do this, if you do that, you have your subselect in the from clause. You can do another select. What will happen then, if you run this explain, and there's a select sleep there, it will hang for 5,000 seconds. So that is because it actually re-executed, right? So there was a blog post published in 2020, which is called Uncommon Sense MySQL. So how do we escalate the privilege? So remember, we have the ability now to create tables, functions, and stuff like that in the WordPress database. And what we want to do is we, we can try to impersonate our monitoring user and trick the monitoring user to run our statement. So. People think that database, it's just data. That's not true. <clears throat> database contains code also. It has a stored procedures, it has functions, it has events. So we can create our proof of concept exploit. And our goal again is to try to trick the monitoring user to execute our code. What we want to do is we want to retrieve the authentication string from mysql.user table, and this is the hash of the password. So we will create our exploit stored function. This stored function will check if mysql monitoring user will execute that function. If it does, it will retrieve this authentication string. If it does not, then it will do the sleep. <coughs> The reason it do the slip is because we want to make this query slow. So now, monitoring user has global select, so it can actually retrieve the hash of the password. So now, what we will do is we will create this function exploit, and then we will create a slow query. And this slow query potentially will be picked up by the monitoring system, and this monitoring system will run explain on top of that slow query. We have one problem though. We can retrieve the, this password, but how do we send it back to us? So what we have in MySQL, we have this <coughs> definer. And definer works similar to SUID <coughs> bit on Linux. We can create another function. And this function that we will create is inside of the WordPress database. 
this function will actually save whatever we will pass it into our table. So what we'll do is we'll create, we will prepare a, a table to store the password, wordpress.p. And then we'll use this save function and whatever you pass to the save function will be will be inserted into this p table. So here is the final proof of concept code. We have our exploit function. This exploit function will test if the user that's running it is monitoring or not. If it is monitoring, then it will select the authentication string and then save it into a variable. And then it will call another function. And this another function will be called with the privileges of our user that we control. And then it will be saved in our table. So now we can save this admin password to the attacker controlled table. So at this point, I have this demo where we have uh, two sides. On one side, we have this bad actor. And this guy has prepared all this stuff, the exploit and uh, save function and uh, table in it. And the goal is to trick them. In this case, we are trying to trick MySQL database administrator. So here's what will happen. We create a slow query. We craft a slow query, and we are under this corp WordPress user, which only have an access to one single database. We have our table. And now we create a, a slow query. This is our query. We do select start from, and then we do a subselect. Subselect is needed to trick the explain to actually re-execute this query. So now this query is slow, three seconds. It's very slow in database world. So a MySQL database administrator, like think me 10 years ago, will take this query and try to understand why it is slow. So they will run explain, and then they will be like this. Why it's slow? It's not slow, right? But back to our attacker, we have a password. So this query, this explain, actually executed our payload, and then will load it into our table that we control. This is MySQL hash of the password for the monitoring user, right? We could have retrieved another password from, an, from another user, or we could have started downloading the healthcare data. So what next would we do with this hash? So I fired up my uh, GPU instance on AWS EC2 with uh, 16 GPUs and I'm trying to break this hash, right? So I started my hash cat, uh, installed my hash cat and uh, removed star, right? So the star is MySQL specific. So you remove star and you get this password, all this hash cat parameters. Let's, let's see, it will probably take a while, right? So let's run it and uh, use this rock U. This is the password list. So I'm trying to do a brute force on that. Less than a second, why? Because the password is pass. It's so simple. Why it is so simple? Because the whoever installed this monitoring system didn't think about this. They thought that they're installing an unprivileged user that has nothing in it. 
At the same time, we actually tricked, we use a confused deputy a problem and trick this unprivileged user to execute the query on our behalf without knowing it. So this database privilege escalation recap is we confuse the monitoring system into running explain on our statement. It's a call, I would call it uncommon sense minus KL, right? like Percona did. Uh, MySQL explain can actually execute the statement, which it should not. And then monitoring user has a global select and execute privileges. It should not. When you create your user in MySQL, think about uh, any system actually, right? Think about least privileges. What is the least privilege it needs? It doesn't need global select, but also don't need execute. Uh, and actually many people, instead of doing that, they actually run monitoring system on the root user, which is, which is of course, not right. So we got monitoring user <coughs> password hash. It is a simple password, easy to crack. And as a result, an attacker can actually reconnect <coughs> to the database. Now we know the, the password of the monitoring user we can reconnect to that database again, and um, we can uh, retrieve the healthcare data because we have a global select. All right, so now we're here. We have the health records database, and uh, we downloaded our data. PostgreSQL, there are a number of examples. If you go to, PostgreSQL is actually very open with uh, uh, exploits. You can go to the security section. This is GDBC, but you can also go to postgres.postgresql.org slash security and you can see the number of CVEs there. Mm, this is the interesting one uh, where it actually also describes uh, the similar privilege escalation <coughs> issue in uh, PostgresSQL. So now our goal is to finally, we want to get, we want to escape <laughs> from the database. <coughs> we are controlling the database fully. And then our goal is to execute code on the underlying operating system. Usually what we do is we want to establish a reverse shell. If we control our system, we want to control it back from, from the attacker perspective. We want to um, use the reverse shell. So we have an admin connection. We need unprivileged operating system command execution. Usually, this is how the open source database stands. There's a different expectations and there is a different, <coughs> I would say, privilege model in different databases. Specifically, MySQL considers that if they have a super user and a root user, inside of the MySQL doesn't necessarily mean that you can execute shell commands. But in Postgres, it's completely different. In Postgres, the expectation is that if you have a, uh, the um, super user role in Postgres, then you can execute directly execute the shell command. So in PostgreSQL, if you have a root user, if you have super user, you can use the things like copy from program. Actually, someone opened a CVE about this. And PostgreSQL community said, it's not a CVE, it's not a security issue. If you control your database, you can do things like this. There's also a like an archive command and you can execute the commands directly. So I have this um, number of recorded demos. So first of all, what we can do in Postgres specifically, right? If we have a super user, we can execute the copy from program. And this is super easy. So let's say that we have uh, a file here. 
right? And then uh, we connect to PostgreSQL. We have root on Postgres. And then we can create a table. I should speed up this demo. And then after that, after we create this table, we can just do copy from program. And then we execute the command. Right? So if we quit, we'll see that now the, the file has been created. Super easy. But even better than that, uh, we can also use this archive command to execute that. This is my PostgreSQL specific. I'll skip that. Uh, but uh, also with the same thing, we can also establish a reverse shell, right? And the reverse shell, is anyone not know what the reverse shell is? So a reverse shell is basically an... Um, a, it's a basically a way to control the system, like Linux, without having the ability to directly SSH to it. So if you execute a program, you can actually start a listener on your machine, and then with a reverse shell, you connect, connect back to your machine and then on your machine, you can pretty much execute the commands, and those commands will be executed on that remote machine. So if you don't have a direct network connection to that machine that you want to control, you can do it the other way around. So um, I need to go back here. All right, so we connect to Postgres. We have a root user on Postgres, and then <coughs> we create a table because this table is needed in our copy command. Uh, and then here we start our listener, netcat listener. And then we do this. We execute the command bash command, and then we control. Now we control the server, the Linux server, from our database. So we performed the database escape. We have started as SQL protocol only, but now we also have the ability to execute the shell commands on the underlying operating system. So let's go back to MySQL. MySQL, it's more tricky. And the thing is, in the standard configuration, in the modern <coughs> versions of MySQL, with the standard <coughs> configuration, it is not possible to escape the database, to go from the SQL protocol to the shell commands. But with the older versions or with a non-standard configuration, it is possible. So what I will demonstrate is, I'll demonstrate writing a file, a UDF, a user-defined function, which is a shared library. And then with a non-standard configuration, I will be able to write that uh, shared library code and then actually trigger that code. So then we can, in the non-standard configuration again, we can write a file. So what we will do is we will create a table and put a data in this table. And we will use um, hex and then uh, first of all we'll need to populate that table right and this we will try to write the content of that table on disk so we have inserted into the demo table and then if we will select that we'll see that it is actually the ABCD. And then there is a variables that controls where 
the plugins are. And there are variables that controls if you can write to that directory. So, in this configuration, there's a plugin deer, and this plugin deer is actually accessible. So, what you can do is you can write the UDF, the user defined function shared library, into that directory. If you have the UDF shared library inside of the varloop MySQL, the MySQL plugin, then you can actually trigger that. And let's take a look. So now, to trigger that, we will, so first we have written the shared library file. And then the second thing we will do is we will create a, an actual, um, an actual UDF, user defined function. Right, we need to create a shared library code. We'll do that. And then we will compile that. And then we will use the method that we already uh, confirmed to write the content of that to disk. Right, so running out of time a little bit, so I'll, I'll skip that. And then finally, when we have successfully written our UDF to varlib MySQL, then we'll need to trigger that. And to be able to trigger that, we will create a stored function. We'll create, sorry, we'll create a user-defined function, which will point to that shared library. So this is what we will be doing now. Again, there is no file there. Then we will, so we wrote myudf.so. So this myudf.so is basically a system one. So with this myudf.so, you can actually execute the system commands, right? So now what we did is we create the definition of that function and then we'll do select. And then the parameter of that function is any command that you can execute on the underlying system. <clears throat> so now I have, with that function, I have the ability to trigger any command on the underlying Linux system. So that means I can also establish a reversal. All right, so now we're here. We have uh, finished step zero, establish the connection we have been able to escalate our privilege inside the database. And finally, we were able to escape from the database to the underlying operating system. So our new target is to attack our database administrator. Right, and this is what we will be doing. This part of the presentation, I actually covered. So uh, the um, ability to create a rogue server, and with this rogue server, you can actually <coughs> execute the code on the, your database administrator workstation. So if you miss this presentation, you can watch the recording of uh, the presentation that I did at 11 a.m. today. So this is also a pretty interesting example. All right, so the conclusion. So what we should do as a blue team? I need to protect our application from the SQL injection. Right, that's obvious. We need to use prepared statements. We need to sanitize the input. We also need to grant only what is needed, the least privileges. This, this example of monitoring a user is wrong. A monitoring user should not have global select, they should not have the execute privilege. And I also use the latest version of MySQL uh, or PostgreSQL, always upgrade. All right, I think that's it. Any questions?
with the password yeah. crashing, uh -huh. cracking. Yeah. Um, if it had been more complicated, that's still something you can crack with a heavy system, right? It'll just take more time. It takes more time. It's uh, it grows, but the time grows. Yes, so if you if you have a uh, twelve random chapters, then I mean, it's all about how much resources you, you have, right? But, uh, I mean, probably it's years, you know, okay. years. Uh, but again, like, you can, if, if, if this is nation state, and right. they have uh, uh, lots of power, right? Uh, then it is also possible. Okay. I think one of the years will change that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you're a nation state, you might have a one computer running around. Yeah, but potentially. Yeah. Well, probably we we're, probably we're not Almost there like yet. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes. From an analyst perspective, if you're looking at simply network traffic going across the wire, uh, what are some good indicators that something like this is happening? Are you just looking for that reverse shell traffic or? Better? What kind of uh, what kind of footprints are left behind? Yeah, so there are multiple things here. One, um, if we go, there are layers here, right? So if um, you can uh, technically you can analyze MySQL traffic, it is not trivial. The analyzing MySQL traffic itself, it's easy. And MySQL also provides your Postgres, provides your audit log, right? So technically, what you can do here to catch that situation is you can uh, collect all the audit logs and see what is unusual here, right? Unusual uh, anomaly detect detection on top of the uh, database logs. This is not trivial because it's always the case where you know something has changed, the application has been updated, or uh, the new query is coming in. But I mean, in theory, that's possible. But now, if you go to uh, where's the slide? Let me go back to the slide. Mm, if you go to the um, uh, to here, right, OS shell database escape. You can potentially catch it with collection of, uh, I, you know, the um, different things. You can you can collect the uh, exec or system on all of your Linux boxes, right? And you can see usually the database runs with its own user. MySQL user or PostgreSQL user, right? You can monitor what kind of commands are executed by that user. Because when you escape, you will be seeing the commands executing from that particular user. And uh, finally, the network traffic. The network traffic uh, probably makes sense in two cases. The first case is for the initial case, the database connection establishment, right? So you can see something there. Uh, but usually, if it's through the application, it's really hard to, to do. Uh, the second is where the bad actor will try to establish the reversal. That's where you probably should catch it, right? Because when you establish the reversal, it is, there are lots of, lots of noise going there, right? So you have a network, you have uh, the IP address of that box, which is probably be unusual uh, to your network and stuff like that. And uh, there are ways you can also see what kind of, like there are predefined reverse shells in Bash and Python and stuff like that. You can catch it on the, uh, on the command execution level as well, right? So the, um, Lots of uh, tools that um, are doing that, uh, they have all these signatures.
Make sense? Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting case. Lots of people ask about this, right? So it's a very very common to try to you know to catch that situation. So th this isn't my space at all. So this might be a stupid question. Um, I would imagine that administrators have access to like auditing tools where they can run it mm -hmm. on the Linux box and say, yeah. Yeah. "This is what I'm running." Take your knowledge and the hundred other knowledges that mm -hmm. I did here, and scour my system, and, and it will come out and say, "Oh, geez, you have this monitor user that has global select. That's a bad thing. See this." Mm -hmm. uh, aren't those kind of tools available or scanning tools for for databases? Uh, to, that encapsulates all this knowledge, mm -hmm. so that you know you take this bit of knowledge and add it to the tool, and someone else finds, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. maybe maybe it says. Oh, you, you're not patched for the CVE. And, you yeah, know. yeah. There is a there are a couple of tools like that. There's a there's a benchmark for databases. It's maybe that's what I'm asking. Yeah. It, there's a benchmark that you can run against the database, and it's actually see uh, it checks the versions against the database. This primarily it checks if the CVE is patched. If the CVE is right. patched, right? But it also checks the privileges. Yeah, so so it can it can see, uh, but this is this is some sort of corner case, right? So this yeah. case is not generic case. This is this is a demonstration of using the confused deputy problem. Well, yeah, but the the vulnerability existed. You wouldn't have the vulnerability if you didn't have a monitor Correct. Uh, thing with with too many privileges. Correct. So so if you had like a, um, a an auditing um, task that was updated like every month with you know, all the current CVE numbers, all yeah, the current... Yeah, little, yeah, yeah. That, that's apps. exactly... That exists, yeah. yeah. That, that exists. <clears throat> that's... Uh, I don't remember the name, but there's a, there's a benchmark tool that... Because of this person who ran that, they yeah. say, hey, here's a red flag. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just had one little small question. Uh, so you were switching to the monitor user, I guess, in your uh -huh. example. But yeah. I wasn't. I didn't think you could do that inside of a SQL query. So would you? I I don't. I uh, I use the. Um, I trick it to run my query. Right. Okay. And so when I run my query, uh, it actually. Uh, let me put it here, right. So. It runs the exploit function. So I'm not switching the user. So would you exfiltrate the data instead of the password? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, can, I, can, I can exfiltrate the, yeah, okay. uh, the, the data instead of password. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right? Other questions? All right, thank you very much.